Okay, good morning and thank you all for coming. So today I'm going to be talking about mapping the gaps in Antarctica and specifically GA's role in uh, understanding the seafloor environment around Antarctica. Australia has been doing seabed mapping work in Antarctica for over 100 years, ever since Sir Douglas Mawson's first voyage. But there's still a lot that we don't know. There's still a lot of gaps that we need to fill. Now this work is actually a team effort and uh, most of the work we do is in collaboration with others. Uh, so there's been a lot of people involved in this work over the last 10 years, um, but there's three people who I particularly like to thank who've made a significant contribution. The first is Phil O'Brien, who really uh, set the scene for doing the detailed mapping work in Antarctica. And the other people are um, Chris Carson and Alex Post, who've both played leading roles in seabed mapping work, and I'd like to thank them for their contributions. So today in my talk, I'm going to give you some context and explain some of the drivers behind why we do seabed mapping in Antarctica. I'll also talk about the current status, where we're at, and how many gaps we have left to fill. I'll talk about GA's role in this work, and I'll give you some examples of where we've used this information to inform others. And then I'll give a bit of an outlook for the future. But first, I'd like to start with a photo. I'm sure you've all seen this photo. It's all around the building. It's on the wall down the back here. It's on the foyer displays as you enter the building. It's in the library. It's up on the fourth floor. Hopefully, you've all seen it. Now, they say a picture tells a thousand words. And I've heard many people describe this photo in various ways. A lot of people say, wow, that's amazing. It's beautiful. You're so lucky. To me, words I use to describe this photo are teamwork, fun, seasickness. But this photo also stirs up a lot of emotion in me. It reminds me of how privileged I am to have worked in such an amazing place. It reminds me of how passionate I am about Antarctica and how lucky I am to work for an organization that encourages me to challenge myself, but also the personal sacrifices I made to work in such a remote location. But the reason I put this photo up here is not to uh, tell you about what it says. I'm more interested in what it doesn't say. And I'm sure that many of you looked at that photo and never understood what actually went into doing this survey. It doesn't tell you anything about the logistical constraints that we faced doing this work, the training and the preparation that was involved before we even got out on the water. And it doesn't tell you why. Why were we in Antarctica bobbing around in a small boat with the icebergs mapping the seafloor? And so hopefully by the end of today, you'll have a much clearer picture of that and why we are doing this work. So this is a talk about mapping, right? But before I get to mapping, I need to, and to explain the why behind that photo, I need to step away from mapping for a minute and talk about the Antarctic Treaty system. So the Antarctic Treaty is recognized as one of the most successful international agreements. There are a few places in the world where there's never been a war, where the environment is protected and where science is a priority. And Antarctica is one of these places. The Antarctic Treaty Parties have declared Antarctica a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. Now, it's not my intention to go into the Antarctic Treaty today, but as far as Australia is concerned, the Antarctic Treaty and maintaining Antarctica a reserve for peace and science is very important for our national interests. So the Australian government has declared seven national interests in Antarctica. There's a lot of words on this slide. I don't expect you to read them all. But in summary, it includes things like conducting world-class research, protecting the environment, and fostering economic opportunities, namely fishing and tourism. There's a lot of words on the slide, but there's actually one that really matters, and that is sovereignty. It's in Australia's national interest to maintain and preserve our sovereignty in the Antarctic Treaty System. So what is Australia's claim? The Australian Antarctic Territory covers 42% of the Antarctic continent, and we also claim the adjacent offshore area. This total area is equivalent to the size of the Australian landmass, and the marine area is approximately 20% of Australia's entire marine jurisdiction. So it's a large area, and we also have three, uh, three stations, Mawson, Davis, and Casey, where we conduct much of our work. So the large area that we claim lies due south of Australia, and we are in the privileged position of having no southern international borders, and no, our southern neighbour is a continent devoted to peace and science, and it's in our national interest to maintain the status quo. The last thing Australia wants or needs is to have to defend our southern border, and that's why supporting a strong and effective Antarctic treaty system is so important for our national system, interests. 
So you may be wondering, this is all geopolitics, what's it got to do with everyday Australians? Well, just imagine if Antarctica wasn't devoted to peace and, peace and science. Imagine if Antarctica was an area of conflict. Imagine if the government had to spend a lot of money defending our southern borders. Quite simply, that means less money for everything else. Now, I don't want to be pessimistic. As I said, the Antarctic Treaty is one of the most uh, successful international agreements, and it's robust. But you still may be wondering, what's all this got to do with mapping? Well, the best way to ensure a strong and effective Antarctic Treaty is to have a presence. And by conducting research, scientific research in Antarctica, we gain influence. Science is the currency of influence in Antarctica. Australia is a leader of Antarctic science. We've been active for over 100 years. We are world recognised across a number of disciplines and international collaborators often come to Australia seeking to collaborate with us and for us to support their Antarctic research. And through all of this, we gain influence. Which brings me back to mapping. Mapping, whether it be geological, geophysical, topographic or seabed mapping, is one of the best ways that we can demonstrate our presence in Antarctica. If we can map the Australian Antarctic Territory and the adjacent marine jurisdiction, we can demonstrate our presence and we can gain influence and we can support our national interests in Antarctica. And that is why in the Australian Antarctic Strategy and 20-Year Action Plan, the government has committed to an enhanced program of mapping and charting in East Antarctica. So that's a very long-winded way of explaining the why behind the photo that I showed earlier. But hopefully it gives you a better understanding of the importance of this work. Before I go any further, I'd like to explain what I mean by seabed mapping. Bathymetry is the foundation of seabed mapping. It describes the topography of the seabed. Most bathymetry information these days comes from multi-beam echo sounders, as shown in this picture. Essentially, it's acoustic technology that sends sonar beams in a swath from the bottom of a ship to the seafloor and records the amount of time it takes to come back again. And this can tell us about the sh depth, shape, and composition of the seafloor. You may also hear me refer to single beam bathymetry, which is essentially the same concept, but it only sends out a single beam rather than a swath, and thereby, therefore provides less information. But seabed mapping is more than just bathymetry. This is a diagram to show the integrated information that we can collect on the seabed to provide a clear picture of the seafloor environment. We can use multi-beam echo sounders to, to collect bathymetry, as, as I've just said. But from this, we also get backscatter information. And this tells us about the hardness, all this, uh, the hardness of the seafloor and allows us to distinguish areas of bedrock versus soft sediments. We can also ground truth this by collecting sediment samples and using these sediment samples to understand the composition of the seafloor. We deploy cameras to look at, to visualize the seafloor environment and look at the communities that live there. And we also collect sub-bottom profiles to look at the subsurface to understand the sediment thickness and sediment deposition history. Most of what I'll be talking about today is bathymetry because it's fundamental to so much of, of the work that we do. Um, but I will touch on some of these other data sets as well. So what are the drivers for seabed mapping? There are a number of them. And one of the most obvious is charting. The reason we need seabed mapping information is to improve nautical charts and, and improve the safety of navigation at sea. The International Hydrographic Organization has delegated responsibility for charting around much of East Antarctica to Australia. So we have international obligations to collect seabed mapping information in Antarctica. Fisheries management is becoming an increasingly important issue in the Southern Ocean. And the Marine Conservation Body for Antarctica, known as CAMLA, relies on accurate seabed information. At a very simple level, one of their conservation measures is defined by depth. They've declared that bottom fishing is prohibited in areas less than 550 metres around the entire Antarctic continent, but a lot of the time we don't even know where the 550 metre contour is. Detailed knowledge of the seabed environment also helps inform fisheries so that they can target areas of interest and thereby minimise their impact. All of the scientific research in Antarctica requires infrastructure to support it. And this includes things such as wharves. So as an example, the UK Antarctic program are currently redeveloping their, their wharf at Rother, Rothera Station. And this is to accommodate their new icebreaker, the Sir David Attenborough, which is much larger and requires a bigger wharf. To do this, they need to know what's on the seabed so that they can plan their wharf infrastructure and also minimise their impact. 
Seabed mapping is important for guiding environmental management, including the protection of vulnerable marine ecosystems and for monitoring change into the future. And seabed information provides important baseline information for monitoring that change. There's also numerous scientific applications, things like understanding past ice sheet history, contributing to ocean models, and understanding marine biodiversity. The need for accurate seabed information in Antarctica is real. The number of ships traveling to Antarctica each year is increasing, and this is driven both by tourism as well as national Antarctic programs who are building more and bigger ships and sending them to Antarctica every year. But for them to remain safe and to avoid negatively impacting the environment, they need bathymetry data. This, this slide shows a number of shipping incidents where ships have run aground in shallow waters in Antarctica. Some of these have occurred in the area where Australia has charting responsibilities. In Australia, charting responsibilities lie with the Department of Defence, and namely the Australian Hydrographic Office. And it's for this reason that we collaborate with them. They need bathymetry data, and so do we. And so we work together with them and the Australian Antarctic Division to collect seabed information. And we operate on the collect once, use many times paradigm, where we collect bathymetry data, they use it for their charts, the Australian Antarctic Division use it to plan their, their operations, and then GA uses it to conduct geoscience research. The need for seabed information has achieved recognition at the highest international levels. At this year's Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, the Antarctic parties adopted a new resolution for hydrographic mapping in Antarctica. And this encourages governments to prioritise the collection of bathymetry data, but also to make available existing data for the benefit of all. And part of the reason for this new resolution was the acknowledgement that there's a lack of good bathymetry data, and nowhere is this more so than in Antarctica. There's also the Seabed 2030 project, which you may have heard about. It's an international project that aims to bring together all the available bathymetry data for the world's ocean into a definitive map by 2030. And the bathymetry data that we collect in Antarctica feeds directly into this global collaborative program. The UN have declared the, the, uh, uh, declared the next decade as the decade for ocean science for sustainable development. And while this covers all aspects of ocean science, they have articulated that a global map of the sea floor is one of the major breakthroughs required to achieve the objectives of the decade. So what is the current status? Well, this is a map, the International Bathymetry Chart of the Southern Ocean. It's a beautiful map, and you may look at that and go, well, it looks like the Antarctic margin and the Southern Ocean have all been mapped. But it's quite deceiving. This is actually a 500 metre resolution chart. And what this means is that, in some cases, there may be one depth measurement for a 500 metre cell. And while this may be useful for certain applications, like Antarctic oceanography models, it's actually not very useful for a number of applications. So this is an example from around Casey Station in the shallow water, and you can see that at a 500 metre resolution, all we know is it gets shallow to deep, moving away from the coast. At the other extreme, you can collect bathymetry to a one metre resolution in these shallow depths. And this is data that was collected by GA and the um, Australian Navy several years ago. And while most seabed mapping data won't be at this resolution, this is a really good example to show the types of information that you can get when you have full coverage, multi-beam data at a high resolution. If you are an operator wanting to know where to anchor your ship, you can see where the deep, shallow, uh, the deep uh, sedimentary basins are, which would be a good location to, to drop an anchor. If you're a marine biologist interested in the shallow, rocky environments because they're important marine habitats, you can clearly see where they are. And if you're a paleo a paleoclimatologist wanting to know what the ice sheet history is, you can clearly see some moraines and glacial features which provide evidence of where the ice sheet has moved. So this high resolution data is far more useful for a number of applications than the 500 metre resolution grid. But back to the 500 metre resolution grid to demonstrate where we're at. This is the source data that went into it. The coloured lines represent multi-beam data and the thin black lines which are barely visible are the single beam data. There's a couple of things to note here. Firstly, it's mostly single track lines. There's been very little dedicated seabed mapping work done in Antarctica. It's mostly ships passing through areas with their multi-beam on collecting data along the way. There's also very little data in East Antarctica where Australia's Antarctic claim is. 
And the other thing you may note is that Australia is not actually visible on this map. So while Australia has actually contributed a lot of single beam data from the Aurora Australis, and we have actually contributed multi-beam data to this um, Antarctic-wide compilation, the area is so small that it's actually not visible on this map. And the reason for this is, until recently, this was the entire Australian fleet of, of marine vessels capable of doing multi-beam mapping in Antarctica. We had two small work boats equipped with multi-beam that were able to work in shallow waters less than 300 metres, but were restricted to working around the stations. So while these two boats have been really useful for collecting that high resolution data I showed earlier, the area we've covered is so small it doesn't even appear on the Antarctic map. So this is uh, the data sources for version two of the International Bathymetry Chart of the Southern Ocean. And as you can see, in the last seven years, there's been a lot more data collected and made available. This includes both data, new data collected um, by numerous ships, but also data that was previously e existed but wasn't publicly available. And this follows a concerted effort by a number of countries to encourage others to share their data. And this includes the Japanese data shown in blue, which has actually been around for a long time but was never publicly available, but has now been added to this Antarctic compilation. The other thing you may notice is that Australia now appears on the map. We have a big green polygon in East Antarctica, which I'll get to shortly. But the other thing to note is there's still a lot of areas where there's no data. There's still a lot of gaps. And that means that most of the bathymetry that you see in that international <coughs> bathymetry chart of the Southern Ocean is predicted. So onto the big green polygon. In 2017, the RV investigator, Australia's Marine National Facility, undertook its maiden voyage to the Antarctic margin. And in that one survey, they collected about 48,000 square kilometres of high resolution, full coverage, multi-beam data. This, that's about the same size as Tasmania, so it's a large area. And in that one voyage, they doubled the amount of available high resolution, detailed bathymetry data in East Antarctica. And the exciting thing about this is it shows what's possible if you've got the right capability and dedicated ship time to seabed mapping. Unfortunately, the RV investigator is only ice strengthened, so it can only work up to the ice edge. It can't work on the continental shelf where there's more ice. So what's GA's role in all of this? I've had a lot of people say, why does GA do mapping in Antarctica? Surely that's the responsibility of the Australian Antarctic Division. Well, there's a number of reasons. One of GA's impact areas is managing Australia's marine jurisdiction. And as I mentioned earlier, 20% of that marine jurisdiction is actually in Antarctica. So it's actually part of GA's uh, strategic directions to ensure that all of that is mapped adequately. And this contributes to some of the work that we're doing in the marine team at GA, such as the Oz Seabed Initiative that you may have seen or heard about. Um, secondly, the Australian Antarctic Program is a whole of government program. It's not, an Australia, it's not an Australian Antarctic Division program. It's a whole of government Antarctic program. And all parts of government, including DFAT, Bureau of Meteorology, Defence and GA have an important role to play in that. We provided input into the development of the Australian Antarctic Strategy and 20 Year Action Plan. And we're also responsible for implementing it. And our role covers a range of activities from across GA, including the geophysical networks, the GNSS station, and seabed mapping. GA is also part of the new Australian Antarctic partnership, a program partnership, which was recently established to better understand the role of Antarctica in the global climate system and its impact on marine environments. So as you can see, GA has a clear role to play in Antarctica. I'll now give some examples of where we've collected seabed data and what we've used it for. Um, and this links back to the drivers for the work. So we use the seabed mapping information to provide advice to government, to support scientific research and to meet our international obligations. And we work across multiple spatial scales, at a continental scale, at a regional scale and a local scale. And so I'll give an example of each of these. At a continental scale, a, a GA seabed mapping work has contributed advice to the Australian government to, be, to declare marine protected areas in East Antarctica. So Australia and the EU are proposing a network of marine protected areas, and you may have actually heard about this in the news over the weekend. The Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources is having their annual meeting in Hobart this week, and they're discussing the marine protected areas. But while they're discussing whether to declare it or not, the scientific case for the MPAs was actually submitted many years ago and was accepted by the Commission. 
and GA played an important role in supporting that scientific justification. Our work involved compiling available bathymetry, geomorphology, sediment and benthic imagery data of the seafloor to understand whether the marine protected areas were comprehensive, adequate and representative of the entire East Antarctic region. So one of the things we did was look at how representative the marine protected areas are of the broader Antarctic region. And this graph shows a frequency distribution of the full bathymetric range for all of East Antarctica at the top and within the marine protected areas at the bottom. And as you can see, the marine protected areas capture a good um, representation of the range of depths within, across East Antarctica. And also, it follows a similar depth distribution. So by looking at this, we can say that what's within the MPAs is representative of the entire seafloor environment of East Antarctica. The only exception is in these deeper depths. But given the decrease in diversity at, uh, in biodiversity at depths, at these depths, uh, the impact of this is probably relatively small. But it's not just bathymetry data we used. We also used geomorph geomorphic information. This is a uh, GA map of uh, the geomorphic features for the entire Southern Ocean. And this delineates the seafloor into different types of, um, of seafloor features. The reason this is important is because there's a really strong link between geomorphology and benthic habitats. And, it, and we can use this as, a, as an, a way of assessing the types of habitats that may exist around the Antarctic margin and also what might be within the marine protected areas. So we broke up the seafloor environment in terms of relative area of each of the geomorphic classes. Um, and this shows the, the relative distribution around East Antarctica. And then we looked at what's actually contained within the marine protected areas. And again, you can see, for example, the abyssal plain. Within the MPAs, we've, collect, we've captured 21% of the entire area within the MPA. And the same applies for many of the other major classes. So what this tells us is that the seafloor geomorphology within the marine protected areas is representative of the broader region. Um, and therefore, the MPAs are representative. My next example is from a regional scale. Now, Cape Darnley is an area in East Antarctica which has been identified as one of only four areas of Antarctic bottom water export. Now, bottom water is an important uh, global ocean water mass that forms on the continental shelf, is exported um, down the slope and into the deep ocean. And Antarctic bottom water is really important for uh, um, the global ocean overturning cycle, and it distributes oxygen throughout the world's oceans. And as I said, Cape Darnley is only one of four areas in Antarctica where this important water mass forms. And oceanographers identified this process occurring at Cape Darnley a number of years ago. But they were very clear in a paper published in Nature Geoscience that one of their biggest issues they faced with their oceanographic models was the inherent errors in the bathymetric data sets. At the same time, we were aware that the Japanese Antarctic program had collected a lot of bathymetry data in this region, but they weren't actually doing anything with it. So I set about compiling this data with the goal of creating an improved bathymetry product for the area and thereby unlocking the value of this existing data set. So this is the uh, bathymetry for the area and this is the 500 metre resolution uh, grid that the oceanographers used in their model. And as you can see on the left, the source data, there's very few actual depth measurements. So most of this grid is interpolated, which probably explains a lot of the errors. There's one multi-beam track that was collected by Germany, a couple of single beam lines, and some um, points that were digitized from nautical charts whose positional accuracy is questionable. So most of the bathymetry in this area is predicted. And so while the oceanographers detected that there was bottom water forming on the shelf and they could detect it in the canyon, it wasn't really clear what the connection was between these two. And so I then compiled all the available bathymetry data from this area that was, I knew was available and created a new 100 metre resolution grid. So most of this data is Japanese multi-beam data, but there's also a lot of single beam data collected by Australia and other nations. Um, and there's also uh, an American uh, US uh, multi-beam track as well. And so we've, I created a new 100 metre resolution grid. And as you can see, it's a huge improvement on what was available before. The canyon features are much better defined. The cross shelf troughs are now much clearer. And importantly, we now have a much clearer um, idea of where the shelf break is. 
And along this shelf break, I identified areas of up to 700 metres in depth where the previous grid had predicted the shelf break to be as opposed to where it was actually measured to be. And so you can understand with areas of 700 metres why the oceanographic models um, had a few problems with the available bathymetry data. But the important thing is there's still a lot of gaps, and it's not until we have 100% mapping coverage of this area that we'll really understand the, uh, the seafloor features in this area. To give a 3D perspective, the new grid allows us to clearly see that there is an export pathway for the bottom water that forms on the shelf near Cape Darnley, through the trough, over the sill, and down the canyon. But you can also see there's a number of errors, and this is part of the issue of compiling existing data sets of varying data quality. And so while this is a huge improvement, the next step for this work is for the oceanographers to actually test this new grid and determine the impact on their models. Is a 100 metre, grid res 100 metre resolution grid adequate? Does it actually help them? Or do they actually need something of much higher resolution? My next example is from a local scale. And GA's done a lot of work around devastation in the Vestfold Hills for a number of years. This is a high use area. There's a lot of scientific research activities. There's a lot of operations occurring in this area. But until recently, we had no understanding of the seabed environment. So back in 2010, a survey done by GA and the, uh, the Australian Navy and the Australian Antarctic Division, it was the first detailed seabed mapping survey done in East Antarctica that integrated bathymetry and other seabed mapping information. And it really opened the eyes to government and the research community about what was possible. So on these integrated surveys, uh, we collected high resolution multi-beam data and this gave us bathymetry at a two meter resolution as well as backscatter. So we can see the shape of the sea floor, and we can see in the backscatter, the areas in red are the hard bedrock areas, and the areas in blue are the soft sediment areas. And this provides us a really clear picture of what's going on in the seafloor environment around Davis Station. We also collected underwater imagery to understand and visualize the seafloor, but also look at what biological communities live there. We collected sediment samples to ground truth the backscatter, but also to understand the properties of the sediments in the area and we collected sub-bottom profile data to look at the sediment history. So prior to the survey in 2010, this was our knowledge of the seafloor environment. This is the nautical chart that existed that gave us a few depth measurements, and the area shaded in blue is basically on the nautical chart saying, don't go there, it's too shallow for boats. That's all we knew. In 2008 was also the, this is a global compilation of bathymetry, and again, there's no data for the, along the coast. Um, and the resolution of the data further offshore is um, not particularly useful for many applications. But following the survey in 2010, we collected this high resolution data, and it really opened our eyes to what the seafloor actually looked like off Davis Station. So this was 42 square kilometres, and then we did a subsequent survey in 2017, when we now have over 100 square kilometres of high resolution bathymetry data for the Davis region. And we also have all these other integrated data sets, the sub-bottom profiles, the sediments, and the, and the underwater imagery. So GA has been compiling and analysing all of this information to understand the seafloor environment and to support a range of applications. So what have we got out of all of this? Well, the image on the top left is an Australian Antarctic Division map of the bathymetry. So by releasing maps, we're demonstrating our presence in Antarctica and we're supporting our national interests. The Australian Hydrographic Office have released a new nautical chart to improve the safety of navigation in the area. GA have released the high resolution data sets and these are now available and being used by a range of people across the scientific community. We did a whole lot of interpretation of the seafloor environment to develop a geomorphic map and a benthic habitat map, and these data sets have been released as GIS layers. And we summarised all of this in the scientific literature. But what is this actually being used for? Well, this is one application of our, um, where we've used this information to better inform our understanding of the benthic um, communities. So, from all the mapping work that we did and looking at the video to understand the, the biological communities, we found that in the shallow bedrock areas, there's two distinct communities. One is an invertebrate-dominated community where the shallow rocky areas are covered in these dense sponge and polychaete um, communities. And in other areas, it's covered by macroalgae. 
which basically is one or two species of macroalgae completely blanketing the sea floor. And what we found, and what others who've done more detailed studies in this area, is that in areas of extensive sea ice cover, we have the invertebrate dominated communities. But in areas where there's less sea ice or the sea ice, sea ice breaks out regularly during summer, it's dominated by the macroalgae. And this has been identified as a critical tipping point. So under future climate change scenarios, if the sea ice changes, we're likely to see this shift from the invertebrate dominated communities to the macroalgae dominated communities, therefore completely changing what's happening on the seafloor around the um, near shore area. And so I used um, this, the knowledge of where these different communities were and the seabed information. So I compiled the slope and the backscatter and the bathymetry data to create this map of pot uh, potential macroalgae habitat. So the areas in green are areas of shallow seabed, of low slope and hard bedrock, where if there was no sea ice, macroalgae could potentially um, inhabit the seafloor. And I presented this work at the International Antarctic Conference last year, and my colourful maps grabbed the attention of the chair of the Committee for Environmental Protection. The Committee for Environmental Protection is responsible for implementing and advising the Antarctic Treaty Parties about environmental protection matters in Antarctica, including in the near shore area. And the chair said to me, this is the exact type of information we need to make informed decisions about environmental management and monitoring of the nearshore environment. So that was really nice justification for the value of this work. It's being used at the highest international levels to inform their decision making. Another application where this work has been used is um, for the environmental assessment for the new Davis runway. You may have heard that the Australian government's planning on building a new runway at Davis. And they're currently doing a whole lot of work to um, look at the environmental impact assessment of this runway. The runway will be built along the coast and therefore they're including the marine environment in their assessment as there may be impacts. And they're using the benthic habitat map that we created to identify suitable sites for monitoring and to try and understand what the impacts may be. Another example of where our uh, seabed mapping data has been used was last season, the University of Tasmania launched, launched their automated underwater vehicle for the first time in Antarctica. They deployed it from the wharf at Davis Station and intended to um, use it to map under the, one of the glaciers. So for the first time, mapping under the ice. And this is a $1 million piece of equipment, so they clearly didn't want it to get damaged or lost. And as I showed earlier, the nautical chart in the area wasn't suitable. And while bathymetry data is not intended for uh, navigation, it can help with survey planning. And so you can see the University of Tasmania planned a track line using our bathymetry data to get from safely from Davis down to the glacier where they could deploy their AUV. One of the problems with doing boat work and collecting bathymetry from ships or small boats is that we can't access areas covered in ice and we can't access areas that are really shallow. So what we end up with is this white strip along the coastline where we don't actually have any data. But that's when we can turn to satellite data. And this is a Worldview 2 image from the Davis area, which clearly shows that there are um, shallow water areas around the station. The bay just to the south of Davis Station, Heidemann Bay, is actually one of the few intertidal habitats in Antarctica. And it is an area of interest to the scientific community. But we can't get in there in the boats. It's too shallow. But what we can do is derive bathymetry data from the, the satellite data and then stitch this together with the multi-beam data to get a, a seamless product from the, the shoreline into the deeper waters. And so this is work that I'm currently doing um, and it's a pilot study because the, the application of satellite derived bathymetry has not been demonstrated in Antarctica before. So this brings me to the future. Where is this all taking us? What does it mean for us in the future? I feel like we're at a bit of a turning point. I feel like when entering this new um, generation of, inf of understanding the seafloor environment. About 10 years ago, we started telling people about the value of this seabed information, and it felt like people weren't listening. But I feel like um, you know, we've been shouting out to people all this time, we need this data, it's really useful. And we've now reached the point where people are coming to us, asking, sometimes begging, for better seabed information. We now have an enhanced program of mapping and charting included in the Australian Antarctic Action Plan. And we have scientists contacting us increasingly for better resolution data in areas of interest. As an example, I was contacted by a krill um, 
a biologist who is doing some work around the East Antarctic margin and looking at the wintering habitat of krill. And they think that the, the canyons are really important, but they've got no idea where the canyons are. So they're like, can you please give us better bathymetry data so we can map out the canyons and go and look for krill? So that's just one example of where the scientific community are requiring bathymetry information, seabed mapping information, to support their scientific research. One of the big opportunities for Australia is the new icebreaker, the Noyina. Uh, it will be delivered to Hobart next year, and it is, it is equipped with all the modern marine equipment, including full ocean depth multi-beam capabilities. And so for the first time, Australia will have the capacity to do full uh, multi-beam mapping from the shallow waters into the deep ocean. It also comes with a science tender which can be launched in the shallower waters to map areas away from station in the shallower waters. And so this is a complete game changer for Australia. This ship will be going to and from Antarctica every year and will be mapping along the way. And it will also have time dedicated to marine voyages. So this will make a big difference in terms of mapping the gaps in Antarctica. One of the big unknowns, one of the big science questions in Antarctica is what's under the ice. We can't access areas covered in sea ice and we can't get under the ice shelves. But technology is changing this. The image on the left is an unmanned surface vehicle. This one's known as the sail drone, but there's many others. The sail drone just completed its first circumnavigation of Antarctica. And using equipment like this, we can get into areas that traditionally we haven't been able to get to in small boats or ships due to um, ice conditions. Under automated underwater vehicles also offer us an opportunity to go in and map under the sea ice and under ice shelves and be able to answer some of those key scientific questions that remain. So what does this mean for the future for GA and for Australia? Well, we need to continue mapping the gaps. As I've said, there's still a lot of gaps out there and it will take us a really long time to fill them. But so that means we need to prioritise. We need to look at areas that, where there's key science questions that are of strategic interest for Australia and where there are operational needs for more seabed information. We need to ensure that the mapping we're doing is fit for purpose, that it's 100% coverage, not just a single track line passing through an area, and that it's at the appropriate resolution to actually make informed decisions. And by collecting this data in this way, we can then meet the needs of the end users. We have a couple of proposals um, in at the moment to use the RV investigator and the, the new icebreaker when it comes online that will hopefully allow us to do some dedicated mapping around East Antarctica and to start to fill some of the gaps. So I'd like to end with the photo from the start. Hopefully now when you see this photo when you're around the building, you have a much better idea of uh, why we were in Antarctica and what it means for GA and for Australia. Thank you. <laughs>